I'll start with a land acknowledgement and dedication. I'm coming to you today from Mississauga, Ontario, just outside Toronto, which is the traditional lands of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. These people remain here as the original and rightful stewards of the land. There are messages in the landscape of history, of surviving and resurfacing place names, of teachings and of stories passed down and those yet to be told. In our work and in our lives, we commit to honoring the ancient and still unfolding story of this land and of these people and their sovereignty. Reconciliation is our collective community responsibility. So I invite you to think about where you are and learn about the history of the land you're on. Um, and speaking the words, the names of the peoples, the nations, the treaties, and hearing your own voice say them gives a, a palpable gravity to each one that you say. So I invite you to say it out loud as you're able and see where that moves you. Uh, I think it's appropriate as we're gathering to speak about care for creation to consider the history of the land that we're on and hold that in our hearts and our minds during our conversation today. I am Jessica Smith. I'm going to be your host for the webinar today. I'm the Foundation's Communications and Campaign Associate. I've been with the United Church of Canada for 10 years this summer and with the Foundation since 2018. Uh, on Monday, my four-year-old asked me, Mommy, do you have fun at work? And I said, "I yes, I guess I do. Do you know what I do at work? And of course, he said, no, it's a little complicated for a four-year-old, but I did my best to explain to him uh, there are lots of people doing really good work that make the world a better place. And there are other people who want to help them do that work. And my job is fun because I get to bring those two groups together. And he seemed satisfied with that answer. So I guess that's my new elevator pitch. <laughs> but I'd like to welcome you today to Works in Action Towards Climate Justice. To help us live out God's call to live with respect and creation, the foundation has put a focus on care for creation and climate justice, the ethical aspects of human driven climate change. In 2022, we named climate justice as one of the foundation's four priorities. And that means many things regarding how we shape our, our shaping the way we work. But one of these ways is supporting people and projects through our Seeds of Hope grant program supporting initiatives and strategies that help the vulnerable communities who are most at risk of the devastating effects of climate change on their way of life, supporting innovative opportunities by communities of faith to live with respect and creation, working for a just, trans a just transition of new ways of generating, capturing, and sharing energy so that workers and creation both benefit. If you feel so moved to help us support this important work, I invite you to make a gift to our Environmental Endowment Fund with gratitude to those of you who already made a donation when you registered for this webinar. Uh, grants from the foundation help move these critically needed projects forward and we couldn't make those grants without the generosity of United Church people. So if you'd like to donate to the fund, there will be a link in the follow-up email. We'll also share it in the chat or you can visit unitedchurchfoundation.ca, click donate now in the top right corner. So we are very excited to showcase a few of these projects today and we're grateful to our panelists for participating and sharing uh, their experiences. Um, we have Sandra Romagnoli from Trinity United Church. Sandra is a devoted member of the United Church of Canada. Uh, she's dedicated 45 years of her life to working as a registered nurse her passions are health equity, clear language communications, meeting people where they are and not where society feels they should be. And believes that the journey begins with one small step. And if we all commit to that, great things are possible. Uh, Sandra is gonna speak to us about uh, her church's Johnny Appleseed project. And we also have Robert Smith from Sandy Soto's Spiritual Center. Uh, Robert has been the keeper of the center um, for the past seven years. And we are so grateful to Rob for joining us today because he's actually retiring at the end of this month. And so he's joined today by um, the person who's going to be taking over his role, Rebecca. And they're gonna speak to us about uh, two projects that were supported by foundation grants, the planting of seedlings, and one which was actually the first grant 
uh, from the Foundation's endowment, uh, Environmental Endowment Fund for placing of the geothermal water furnace. So I'm going to invite them to speak a little bit more about their projects. Sandra, if you want to start and tell us about uh, the work that you guys have been doing. Okay. Hi, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining and being interested in this project. The Johnny Appleseed project was launched actually in the fall. The idea was in the fall of 2021, and it came to fruition in uh, 2022. Children's Story um, during a church service focused on the Johnny Appleseed song, which we sung as children and as adults. And it one of the verses that was discussed was, uh, and it, you plant a seed, for the world to see or for the world to share. And the word share resonated with me. I approached our minister who put me in contact with our GPS 365 uh, committee group who does a lot of outreach. They suggested I apply for a grant through the United Church of Canada Foundation, which I did and it was successful. So we have made, we have created uh, two raised gardens and the produce from those gardens supports community care of West Niagara, which is located in Lincoln, Ontario, the same town as our um, as our church. And probably if one were to walk, it would be less than a kilometer if we were to put the produce we uh, produced in a wagon and walked it over there. We've um, tell me if I'm talking too much or keep going. Keep going. So uh, what we wanted to do was we made raised beds. We installed um, a recycled food safe um, water container, big drum. You'll see them in the in your community. Probably they have great big wire uh, perimeters around them. We installed that on the property so that our eaves troughs drained into it. We were able to water our gardens with rainwater. We didn't have to use any town water at all. Um, we had lots of people who donated time, their their vehicles. Um, one young lad, a young gentleman, young adult in our church planted seedlings, and we were able to produce uh, food, fresh vegetables, and also cut flower arrangements for the participants or the clients of Community Care West Niagara. It had started out that we were going to also support the migrant workers' food boxes, which the Anglican dio dio diocese uh, in town um was supporting but that program uh unbeknownst to us as our project um got underway that program was discontinued they did deliver food boxes to migrant workers at the place that they worked but that was discontinued so community care was our real uh beneficiary for produce keep talking or is it somebody else's turn <laughs> Sure, we'll we'll talk more about it in, in uh, as we keep going. Uh, Rob and Rebecca, if you want to share a little bit about your projects. Yeah, thanks uh, everybody for um, participating in the webinar today and thank you to the Foundation Seeds of Hope for um, granting us the um, money to proceed with our two projects. Uh, the one project that we did was the uh, geothermal water furnace. Uh, it was a replacement of our furnace. Uh, the center has always had a geothermal water furnace in its uh, meeting hall since it was built in 1990. Um, so we have an under uh, underground loop that uh, is used by the furnace for circulating and producing uh, heat and air conditioning for the hall. Uh, it has drastically reduced our uh, consumption of uh, hydroelectric uh, uh, electricity. And uh, it's been a, a very good option for, for the hall. Um, so in, yeah, 2021, we uh, started to have uh, some maintenance issues with the current uh, geothermal water furnace. And we looked at options of fixing it. And the best option that we had was to look at replacing it because it was uh, 20 years old at that time. Um, so we applied to the uh, United Church Foundation Seeds of Hope and uh, were granted uh, money to go ahead with that. And we also managed to uh, have uh, 
the Thomas Hill Foundation Winnipeg uh, granted some money toward that project as well. So we were grateful for getting that uh, getting that done. Uh, and the furnace has been uh, operating really well uh, since we did that. Uh, and if it wasn't, we could really notice a difference on our uh, utility bills, because uh, if the geothermal part isn't working, there's a backup electric furnace that is there. But uh, we definitely don't want to have that working when we don't have to. So, so that was the one project and we were very, very grateful for the uh, support for getting that uh, replaced. Uh, the other project that uh, we did last spring was uh, we applied for uh, planting uh, 700 seedlings on the property here at Sandy Soto. We got uh, 500 uh, hazelnut seedlings and 200 Saskatoon seedlings, which we planted uh, some around our garden space that we have and just uh, some around the property just to have them distributed out and about uh, and uh, try and put them into areas where we had existing Saskatoon and hazelnut uh, trees. Uh, so we're anxiously uh, looking forward to uh, seeing how they did over the winter and uh, seeing how they're gonna expand and uh, continue to grow this uh, spring and summer and fall and uh, looking forward to when they will be producing some hazelnuts and Saskatoons into the future so that uh, when we have guests at the center that they would have an option of going out and picking some Saskatoons. Uh, that would be if the uh, bears don't get to them first, because uh, we do have a few bears on the property that might uh, might be hungry as well. So we'll see whether we're helping to uh, to feed our uh, our bear uh, friends or whether we're having some fruit around for some of our guests that are here on site. Uh, but yeah, it was uh, great to get the uh, the 700 uh, seedlings in the ground. Our maintenance uh, person. Uh, and his uh, helper were the ones that did most of the work on digging all the holes and getting the seedlings in place. So I went out and managed to dig uh, maybe 50 of the holes myself, but uh, it was uh, hard digging in some of the places on the, on the ground, but uh, yeah. And uh, we also had a, a, one of our summer students that uh, was with us at the time. She went out and helped to um, put some of the seedlings into the holes after they were dug and put all the dirt back in and uh, cover them with some leaves to have some uh, water that would stay with the seedlings to help them uh, get uh, their roots set. And uh, it was uh, it's going to be really good to see how they uh, grow and develop in the next uh, five to 10 years. Awesome. Um, thank you. So, Sandra, um, can you describe how your project is, is addressing climate justice? Maybe um, how the community garden is promoting sustainability and how it's addressing food security uh, within the broader context of climate justice? Yes. <clears throat> so Community Care West Niagara has, is, is the only local food bank in our town. Um, the needs as when you hear on any newscast talking about food banks, the needs have increased exponentially throughout the pandemic and have continued to do so. We are still in a pandemic, but as we emerge from the acute phase of the pandemic. So what this has done is food banks mostly um, have canned and preserved food, offering people, um, fresh produce and offering and growing it close to home where transportation isn't an issue, like a kilometer away is, is a small issue. Using um, rainwater to water the ground, using, uh, we have wooden um, raised beds so we're not encroaching on using man-made products to build our raised beds. So if something should happen, they would decompose into the, into the ground wood not treated wood, but it addresses the need in our local community for um, fresh food to feed the, the population that is struggling with, um, with food concerns. 
we've also taken up a small portion of the lawn at Trinity United Church. We have quite a large uh, green space on the corner of William and King Street in our town, but we cut with a gas lawnmower. So this has decreased a small amount, I must say, of, of property that needs to be cult or maintained with our gas lawnmowers, but it every little bit helps. As I said, one small step is a step in the right direction. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else, how that's, how's addressing it, but we're not, we're not using anything or everything's organic. We're not using any pesticides. We're not using any fertilizers other than organic materials. Um, it's, it's sweat equity to make the, the garden grow and to uh, harvest and to transport it. But one of the other things, does it address climate change? Does it address somebody's day? We also offered cut flowers. People with food insecurity don't have extra money to put flowers on their table. So that that's that's a reach out of we care about you. It's a conversation starter with families that they can talk about how flowers are part of part of nature and how we can brighten somebody's day with that. And we didn't use just flowers. We used when some of the produce went to seed or when our dill grew tall, we cut those, the dill seeds off and they were blooms in bouquets. Uh, people donated some of the stuff from their local, their own little garden at home and brought it to the church. And we were able to probably distribute over the course of the summer, I would say 30 to 50 bouquets uh, total to the participants. It's really lovely, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, Rob, can you talk about the impact of the uh, planting of seedlings on the environment? Well, the seedlings are going to help with uh, the uh, production of oxygen for breathing with uh, converting the carbon into oxygen when the leaves are getting bigger on the trees and uh, just to provide some shade and uh, They'll be providing uh, some food for our kitchen, uh, we hope, for uh, getting some Saskatoons for uh, helping out with that. And uh, yeah, just uh, in general, uh, providing uh, better uh, shade and coverage for the uh, grounds here uh, to replace some of our aging, uh, aging trees that are starting to uh, show their signs of age and we're, we've had to cut down uh, more than we like to in the last few years. So we needed uh, something that would be replacing them. Um, we've constantly uh, been looking at ways to uh, plant new trees and uh, we uh, look at uh, our uh, seedlings that are growing on their own when we're cutting the grass and make sure we go around them when they get big enough so that uh, they're not being uh, chopped down uh, to provide natural uh, regrowth and new understory for the for the center. And uh, our maintenance uh, person is uh, really good with uh, with trees. He's, uh, he's planted a few acorn uh, seeds and uh, have then grown uh, in the last couple of years and they're getting big enough now that we can plant those as seedlings too. So uh, yeah, we're constantly uh, looking at uh, at ways of uh, regenerating our uh, undergrowth and our trees to uh, make sure that we're going to continue to have uh, a good uh, spot for our guests to come and uh, be able to be on the land with some trees to uh, keep them company so that they can go out and uh, have uh, some uh, experiences on the land and in, uh, in our acreage here that uh, will include uh, opportunities for them to go fasting in, uh, in the tree treat areas so. Yeah, one of the the effects of uh, climate change is the extreme weather events that are happening more often and often trees are uh, one of the victims of that. So replacing them uh, before they, you know, before they're all down is a, an important step to do. Uh, can you also talk about um, the water furnace project and the advantages of you using the geothermal energy and, and how it's uh, 
promoting sustainable practices? Uh, yeah, the geothermal uh, furnace uses an underground uh, water loop that was uh, installed when the uh, uh, initial uh, hall was built in about 1990. Uh, so we're still using that, uh, that loop that uh, was installed in the ground at that time. And that uh, saves a lot of uh, energy that would be used to produce uh, electrical energy. We, we don't have uh, natural gas at this location, uh, but I have been in conversation with a church in Winnipeg that is looking at converting their heating system from a natural gas furnace to uh, geothermal. And they've uh, asked if they could send some people out to uh, talk about how our geothermal system works here and uh, just take a look at it and understand how the impact could save them uh, uh, on the consumption of, of natural gas in Winnipeg. So. That kind of leads in, into what I was going to ask next about the impact of the projects on on the community as a whole, and if if you've received any feedback from um, other groups and maybe individuals who are interested in it, if you want to continue that thought, Rob. Well, we've uh, yeah we've had conversations with uh, some of our uh, people that are connected with the center and know about the geothermal system that's here and. Uh, just had some interest in learning more about it and uh, trying to understand the uh, significance of the uh, impact on the environment from using the geothermal loops as opposed to a natural gas uh, source for heating their furnace and uh, their air conditioning. So yeah, uh, we're open to uh, any groups that would like to come out and uh, have a look at the system itself and try and see what the impacts are on the on the environment here. So. Yeah, Sandra, what's the, what types of feedback are you getting from your community and, and the members of your community of faith as well? Well, there was support from our members of like from our community of faith. There was an initial uh, amount of money that was put forward before, <laughs> pardon me, before um, the application in our our, our, the grant monies that we so thankfully received um, from the Seeds of Hope. Community Care West Niagara was very pleased and anecdotally, they gave us the total number of poundage that we did produce, but we got a lot of anecdotal feedback too. And just as a, a story, one of the days that I was the delivery person, there was a, a distressed individual um, at community care for, I'm not sure what exactly her concern was that day, but it was a day that we also had flowers. And it was a, it was a, a moment that I, I, I remembered because it broke the cycle of distress that she was in when somebody offered her that bouquet. It distracted her from whatever her anxiety, her issue was of that moment so that they, she could have a more meaningful conversation with the, with the folks at community care. So they're very excited that we're going to continue with the project this year um, to produce flowers and, and food uh, for their members. There was some interest. We, again, I mentioned a young gentleman who's actually been accepted into the Niagara Parks Horticulture Program for the fall of uh, 2023. But he started a lot of our plants in his garage last year, and he came forward and offered to do that. And there's hints that he's going to do it the same again for us. So we had seedlings that we could start in our garden that were homegrown. And um, it was quite remarkable that a 18 year old gentleman yeah. was interested in a project like this. And he, his, his knowledge of horticulture before he even enters that program with Niagara Parks is extensive. And he, he was quite a resource. Individuals came forward and said, I, could, I can move that down to community care this week. Tell me what day is pickup day and I'll deliver it. So there was, there was input from that. And I did re uh, receive support from not only the foundation, but a church in um, Simcoe who had done a similar project and was a recipient of the Seeds of Hope grant previous. I, I read about them and I was able to contact one of the individuals there who gave me great support, told me a little bit about how to go about it. And then I was able to also reach out to Eric Lafort. He gave me some some feedback on my application last year. 
So there was support from all different prongs that you may not think that, oh, but you just pick up the phone or you send an email and there's people there to help. So don't be shy, <laughs> you know, reach out and people are there. Yeah, that's that's old Wyndham United Church. We we did feature them in a couple of th different things. That's good to know that their their work is uh, inspiring others as well, as I'm sure yours is. Um, so I, it kind of leads into this question that I'm going to ask Sandra. You can expand. Did you have specific goals for the project, um, and do you have different goals going forward? We did, but there were several goals to just actually build the garden to try and bring after COVID and we were all separated for two and a half years. People were, you know, we were hesitant to um, be together, um, rightfully so, but I felt that one of the goals would be kind of to reinvigorate some of the volunteerism at Trinity United Church. And in an outdoor space, I it was hoped that that would lessen some of the concerns that people might have about maybe joining in a project in an inside building where it's a confined space and should we be doing that? Can we do that? Do we need to mask? The outdoor aspect of it, I felt would be um, more invitational to, uh, to others. Um, it played out somewhat. It, it did, wasn't as it, um, wasn't as fulsome a, a goal or an outcome as I had hoped, but it's, it's, it's on the table again this year that we can meet out there. Did I have a goal of how much food we would produce? No, I didn't, because sometimes your garden is up to God if you get good weather or if you don't. Um, but it was well over, uh, I think it was 122 pounds of like garden vegetables, uh, salad, greens, tomatoes. We were really successful with our potato crop. Um, so that was one of our goals to do that. And again, one of the big goals was not to have to use town water or any of those things. Um, so our water tank was really, um, it caught, it asked, it, was, it created a lot of questions about what's that thing and what's that doing and what are we all about? And we're hoping to, we're going to be hooking that up again for this year's gar garden, but we're going to do a little plumbing on it. So we're not carrying watering cans back and forth because it gets a little heavy when you're just across <laughs> across to the garden so we'll be installing hoses but the goal was to produce the basic thing was to produce food uh united our trinities had a long uh relationship with community care west niagara with their food drives and um monthly uh donations to them it, either food or financially and so this would just strengthen that relationship wonderful uh Rob, were there specific goals for your projects? Um, well, the goal with the uh, geothermal water furnace was to uh, replace the one it had to, uh, to ensure that uh, we could uh, be conserving energy and not having to increase our uh, uh, consumption of consumption of energy and, and to uh, look at uh, being environmentally friendly on that uh, on that front, because um, we're always looking at ways here to uh, change our uh, energy consumption to reduce it if possible, as opposed to increasing it uh, to reduce our uh, carbon footprint. Uh, we did have uh, another project that we did with the. Uh, Faithful Footprints uh, program as well that helped to uh, reduce our carbon footprint on uh, a number of uh, energy consumption fronts that we had looked at. So uh, that was our that was our overall goal was to look at ways to conserve energy as opposed to uh, expanding our energy consumption to uh, reduce our carbon footprint. And the same thing with the uh, with the trees at the seedlings. Uh, the goal there is to uh, provide the uh, the understory for the future for the uh, for the site here at Sandy Soto, and to uh, ensure that uh, we have uh, oxygen for people to breathe when they come here for the trees that are producing that, and uh, have spaces for uh, people to 
go out and, and enjoy the land and uh, find some peace and quiet uh, while they're here in a in a safe and uh, peaceful space. So you've both touched on. Um, oh, Sandra, did you want to add something more to that thought? Go ahead. <laughs> I, I did. It just occurred to me. We right beside our church um, is a home daycare. And I happen to be gardening also one evening. So how does this reach out in the community and strengthen relationships? There are families that come and pick their children up. And I was there, I guess, at pickup time or approaching that. And one of the moms stopped and talked to her little, her son said, see this garden, see these people are growing food. And then we have a, a huge sign there that, um, the foundation was also helped uh, so that we could let people know what that is when they walk across our property. So we were able to have a conversation with this little fellow about how you can grow food and make it, you know, and somebody can make this for their supper. And it was a whole conversation starter about a little more broadly in the community. It, it, it's raised some interest that way. And we were able to do have a Kojiko interview with Kojiko is our local um, cable TV company. And they do little like info minutes to I probably to fill in space between other programming. I'm not sure, but we were able to advertise or talk about our project there and it went all across Niagara to people who subscribe to Kojiko. So it's not that you know there's Trinity United Church on the corner of King and William. It's Trinity United Church that's trying to reach out into the community. Okay, great story. Um I guess it kind of leads into this too. You guys are doing great with this, leading into the next questions. So you, you both touched on um, the foundation support and how much it meant to the projects, um, but um, maybe you can describe the process, um, the actual steps that, that uh, went into coming to um, the foundation for support and applying for a Seeds of Hope grant um, and deciding to come to the foundation in particular um, for, for a grant. Sure. Sure. <laughs> so when I, this whole idea of the Johnny Appleseed, I spoke to our minister at the time. I said, so this makes me think about this. So she put me in contact with the right committee at our church who then made a motion to our church council because I wouldn't apply for a grant unless I had the okay. <laughs> so I, I reached out to Old Wyndham to find out a little bit more about it. And so there was a process when it came to that, there's a, like administrative things. So our council approved that I should go ahead and put the application together. It was an opportunity for me to learn a little bit more about just how you go about that. Cause I don't, I don't think I'd ever written an, a grant application in my life before. But things about, and to help me conceptualize the way the application set out, it helps you conceptualize, you know what you want to do, but it helps you spell it out, what it is you're going to do, what your goal is, how you're going to achieve it, what, how to cost it out better. Um, and the support, like I, I had lots of support. I even had some technical issues just using my Apple computer with a with a PC. And so uh, the foundation was able to help me, um, who I spoke with there, how to go about navigating even some IT issues. So, it, which was very helpful. Um, the application set out, you know, just kind of like demographic, basic stuff you need to do, what's your, what's your charitable number, all those kinds of things. And then it moves you through a, a good thought process to, so that you've conceptualized your project and then you hit submit. <laughs> and so, um, but those were the steps that that I was unaware of, but it's okay. I, I it was it was set out pretty pretty straightforward. Yeah, for for many churches, this is probably the only grant funding, or the I should say, not the only, but maybe the first um, time that they're dipping their toe into um, seeking grants to fund certain projects in their in their churches. So. Um, yeah, just some insight into the process of it for other people who may be considering this uh, in their community of faith or in their organization is, is helpful. Rob, did you have anything to add um, to that about coming to the foundation or deciding to come approach the foundation for funding? 
Well, we had uh, applied a few times before for some other different projects as well to the Seeds of Hope. And uh, I was uh, looking for ways of uh, finding some money to do the geothermal water furnace replacement. And I thought the uh, Seeds of Hope uh, would be a good place to, uh, to apply to. Um, and uh, with the knowledge that the United Church uh, did have the uh, uh, goal of uh, supporting changes to help the uh, environment and to uh, be supportive of that. Uh, the application process uh, was uh, quite straightforward. Uh, just talking with some people at uh, Seeds of Hope uh, beforehand just to make sure that uh, they were okay and uh, thought that our success of uh, getting a grant was pretty good after applying to them so when we didn't go through the whole process of uh, doing that and uh, not uh, being successful so they were very good at uh, giving some help along the way as to what uh, would help out with uh, being mm -hmm. successful in the application and uh, yeah uh, I guess advertising when the deadlines were to make sure that we could get them in on time and uh, it was uh, yeah very helpful for the for the seeds of hope uh, to do that um, yeah good we we do hope that our uh, support is not just financial and that we can help you in in all sorts of different ways um, so we're going to open up to questions from the group. Um, if either of you want to add anything further about um, the, the stage that your project's in now or um, any other thoughts on support from the foundation while we wait for some questions to come in, um, feel free to um, expand on anything that you've already said or, or anything that you think we've missed chatting about um, while we wait for some questions. I guess the one thing I was grateful for was the timeliness of the uh, approval for the grant because when our water geothermal water furnace wasn't working, it was in the middle of January. So it was rather cold outside here in Manitoba in the middle of winter. So it was kind of uh, very helpful to get that support so that we could get it done uh, and not have to use our backup electric furnace for any longer than we had to. So, <laughs> I'm sure I've heard about those Manitoba winters. I've actually reapplied this year for some ongoing support, financial support from the foundation because gardens are kind of a renewable thing. Your soil kind of settles over the winter. Um, you see things that perhaps you could have done better last year, like the hose, <laughs> the hose from the yeah. water, tank, those kinds of mechanical things. And we're also thinking about um, some covers for the for the raised beds to prolong our our growing season, so that we can warm the the soil up earlier in May, so we can plant earlier, and extend the growing season a little bit further into September. So when early frost happens, maybe we can just squeak a few more weeks out of that garden, and perhaps in the springtime we'll be able to get those seeds or plants in the ground just maybe even 10 days earlier makes a huge difference in your what when you're able to harvest so um, it's kind of a renewable project um, and we're hoping for some support and we understand that there might be newer projects that need to have that support but if it's possible that'd be grand <laughs> yeah with our seedling project we're taking this year to monitor how they're doing to uh, see if we planted them in a good location or if there might be other better locations on the property that we could be planting uh, future seedlings in. So we could very well be applying for uh, more uh, support from the Seeds of Hope uh, for next year for when we see how the current seedlings are doing and uh, just monitor that, uh, that progress. So. And, and that might be something that people aren't aware of as well, um, just because you've had one project supported by a, a foundation grant in the past does not mean that you are ineligible for future funding uh, for other projects or even related projects. So um, we are always open and happy to speak with anybody about um, the eligibility of their projects. 
um, and help you with the application process. Um, so if anybody has any questions, I have one here that was sent to me. Um, is there something that you wish you knew before you applied for a grant? I can't. I can't really say yes. It's one of those things you have to jump in and then you you learn. Um, you know, there's a pack, the package of demographic stuff. I could have probably, if I'd known about that, I would have had that all researched and just had that available to me at home before I started the application project instead of having, oh, pause, gather that information and put it together. So maybe this is just a lesson for anybody who wants to put out or to apply for an application, like, you know, your demo who's going to be your signing authority, um, what's your charitable number, like a package with all that information, your church's website, your fact, like just have all of that available. Your office administrator might have all of that, but I'm not the office administrator. I'm just me. So, um, you know, it, it wasn't difficult to get that, but it just was, oh, a pause of the project. I, be, I better go and get all of that together and come back to the table. One thing about the application is though, you don't have to do it in one fell swoop. You can pause, it saves your information. You can go back before you hit the submit button at the end, you've got an opportunity to go through and make sure that you've presented your project in a way that you're, you're pleased with um, until the deadline, of course, when you have to submit, but there's lots of time to, for review. So that's also very helpful. And I, I didn't really know that until I started the process. And I thought, oh, save button. Okay, this is good. I don't have to get it all done. Mm. Yeah, that was very helpful to be able to work on it a bit at a time and uh, and see what else you required for filling in the rest of the application and gather that and then go back in and complete that and see what else you needed to uh, try and find the information on for completing the rest of it after that. And just making sure you had it all done by the deadline for getting it submitted. <laughs> A, a little known fact, which we did try and, and promote a little bit uh, for this past the spring round was that you can save it and go back to it um, as you gather more information um, or if you need to change anything on it before you press submit, you can always go back to it and just keep saving it. Um, Lance, let me know that he has a question. So Lance, you can unmute and ask your question. Hello, folks. My name is Lance Howard. And I'm with Wesley United Church in St. Andrews, New Brunswick. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to Jess and Sandra and Rob for the, the for leading this webinar. I think it's a great opportunity and uh, really appreciate it. Uh, Wesley in St. Andrews is a community of faith that's been there for a long time. Um, we have an old building. We spend too much time, too much money on energy we have a fairly big carbon footprint because we burn a lot of heating oil and i suspect that's a fairly common story around the united churches in the country so um you know these days partly because there's a federal government program uh, for a 25 percent grant on new equipment that's getting us a little bit excited and so we're looking at reducing our carbon footprint and reducing our energy costs, just like the Sandy Soto people have been doing for the past few years. Um, so I guess my question, I don't know, Jess, this may be a question best to you. Um, is the foundation opening up to receiving applications from communities of faith that are looking to, I'll say, get off fossil fuels or looking to, I don't know, install solar panels or heat pumps or those, those kinds of more climate friendly uh, infrastructure? Um, I'm not gonna say no, um, because obviously we, we have supported that uh, project at Sandy Soto, but I also wanna draw your attention to something that our colleague from UCC, Lori, has put in the chat there, um, the faithful footprints. And I, I believe we're also going to, or we did drop a link for um, applying for those, that, that funding as well. Um, there are a limited number of grants that can come from the Foundation's Environmental Fund, which is probably one of the only funds that would grant for projects like that. Um, but there is more funding available uh, through Faithful Footprints. Lori, I don't know if you want to chime in there and, and add something. Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, your question is a good one, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity for you to connect you with like Faithful Footprints is specifically 
of United Church program specifically for churches and communities of faith to reduce their carbon footprint. So I would suggest that um, if you go to the website, you can um, then like su submit your um, interest and then connect with a regional hub. So are you in the Atl Atlantic region? Is that uh, right? So Lori, I have to say that our congregation, our, our community of faith did use faithful footprints about okay. three years ago and it was very successful we did a lot of um in that time we were doing a lot of insulation work so uh we tightened up the building and we ins you know we insulated the the foundation and the the attic and all that good stuff um that was a very successful project and we really appreciated the um the help of faithful footprints we found it actually very easy to um to get through you know the the application process uh, the the approval process and and the after approval process went very well um now we're saying okay we've got a fairly tight building now we want to get off fossil fuels so um i don't think we can go back to faithful footprints a second time am i correct uh, i don't know if that's the case um i can um yeah, I, I don't know. I, I can check. I, I would hope you'd be able to go back, but I'm I'm not sure. So it's a good question. Thank I you. Can, uh, the other, and just while I have the, the floor for a second to say that if many, many of you are in communities of faith and you're trying to um, strengthen your climate commitment and to say that there's a, a an opportunity for young adults to be climate motivators. So it's an eight week position in the summer and they all gather for residential component and also work for climate. And they need a, a sort of a sponsor from their community of faith to have someone at a local community of faith who will work with them in the local piece and then be connected with the national piece. So I'll put in the chat the link, but if any young adults in your community of faith who are interested in climate, it is a it can be a way to help strengthen. It is during the summer, which is a quiet time, I know, for church activity, but I don't think the onus is too big on the community of faith and it does create an opportunity for young adults to connect to climate. So um i'll put the link in the chat and really enjoying the conversation thanks thanks Lori. there is one more question that has come through to me uh do you have advice for those who are wanting to initiate similar projects go for it <laughs> <laughs> you uh advice um you need to you need to get your ideas on paper and you need to garner some local support. And for my, for our project at Trinity, you need some sweat equity because you do need to build the gardens. Um, you need to move the soil into the gardens. And I don't know sure about all United Churches, but we are an older community of people for the most part. We have some young, able, you know, young folks. But you need to make sure that you've got those kinds of supports available and make sure that if you're for our gardens we reached out to community care and asked them what it is they wanted us to grow not just what we wanted what could we grow well we can grow zucchini and we can grow this and we can grow that but what do their clients really want so it's more of not what we want to do but it's what can we do to support others where they're at so that kind of research, I think, is is helpful so that you're not expending time and energy on something that nobody really is interested in having. Rob, did you have anything to add? Uh, just to uh, say that, yeah, if you have an idea for how you could reduce your carbon footprint to uh, yeah, put it down on paper and share it with uh, whoever you need to share it with to try and carry that forward forward, whether it's your council at your local church or uh, another uh, group that uh, you're looking at uh, trying to uh, help with uh, reducing reducing the carbon footprint. Uh, the Keepers of the Vision here at Sandy Soto were very supportive of the uh, uh, initiative of trying to reduce our carbon footprint, so that wasn't a problem convincing them to to proceed with the with the applications and to uh, yeah, look at uh, ways of uh, making uh, the center more energy efficient. So, the, and the Faithful Footprints program was very helpful as well. Yeah, so if people haven't applied for that, they should look at uh, look into that as well. So. 
Thanks. Okay, well, I think we've kind of come to a natural end here. I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, we're so thankful to have these opportunities to amplify um, the important work of all our grantees and uh, thank you to the panelists for sharing your time today and your wisdom with all of us. And I do want to remind everybody that the foundation convenes these webinars every second and fourth Thursday of the month. One webinar is a how-to and the other is a works in action like this one where we invite grantees and other foundation allies and champions and associates to share what they're up to. So um, follow us on, on our social media or get on our newsletter list so you know when these are happening. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at uh, future webinars. So thank you again to everybody. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you for thank being you.